Hello, Ronnie. You all right? I'm good. Are you well today? Yeah. <laughs> You've got a busy time because you're obviously juggling your your day job with also talking about this new book you've written. Yeah, I've, I've managed to sort of like condense my snooker down to like about eight hours a week. So it leaves up quite a lot of time to just do other stuff now. So I've f- I figured out a way. That's good. Kind of get it all in. You're managing it. Well, it's a brilliant book. I really, really enjoyed reading it. It's called Unbreakable. Mm. And you open the book. It's a sort of very poetic opening, describing what it feels like to play good snooker when you're in mm. almost, I'm imagining it feels like a sort of meditative state, a yeah. flow state. Is that a state that you that you crave? Uh, I think it's sort of like, you know... I, I think you get kind of got to a point in my life where I felt a bit unhappy in myself and I kind of searched for a bit of peace and I didn't realise that I got that inner peace from playing snooker. Um, so in a way, I now play snooker just to kind of get away from the noise and the distractions of life and I, I, I love what I do now more than ever because um, I didn't realise that that's what I was getting. You know, I get a lot of people go, oh, you know, I'm trying to find myself and trying to find that peace and quiet and... I kind of get that from playing. So I now use playing as a chance to sort of just be in that, sp- in that space, really, you know. At what point do you think you stumbled across that realisation that that was where you would, you would find that peace and experience it? Um, I don't really know, really. I just, I, just, I think it's, it's, a, it's a, difficult, quite a difficult one, really, because you have moments where it just feels like, you know, the, the best the best time when you're feeling really good is when you're in the most intense pressurised situation, but you still feel calm and relaxed and you just think, I'm in total control here. Um, when I go to the practice table, then every day feels like an easy day because you're just practising, no one's watching you, there's no pressure, it's just you and the table and the balls and you're having fun. But the, 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 the most beautiful place to be is when you're in an intense Big match, big final, world championships, there's loads of pressure, but yet you feel like you're so calm, you're so in control, and you just think, ah, oh, this is like this is like the, the icing on the cake, you know. So for me, it's about, you know, the, the ultimate buzz and the ultimate meditative state you can get in is when you're doing it in in like an intense situation, you know. And what's the I guess the recipe to to experience that under pressure? Because like Everybody, although you've obviously had hours and hours of honing your skill and you've got natural talent in the mix, as well as all mm. of that sort of study and, and practice, obviously we all wake up and some days are good, some days are bad. It might be you've slept badly or you've got something going on in your life that's distracting mm. you. What is the recipe to feel that sense of peace under that immense pressure with all eyes on you? I think you just got to love what you do. And I think... I think the, the, other, the other person that mentioned it as well was Gaza. And I'm not saying I'm anywhere. I mean, he was like, he had like ridiculous fame. And I don't know how he dealt with it. But I remember listening to one of his things where he went, the only time I get real peace is when I'm on that football pitch for 90 minutes and I'm just left alone. And I just think that that sort of, that resonated with me really in a way that I kind of think that no matter how bad things are in life, the minute I get on that table, I become a little boy again. You know, just become that 10 year old, that eight year old that just loves playing. And I've learned that if even if I'm having a really shit day and I'm not playing great, it's all right. You know, you know, we, we can't always be great every day. But I, I always I, I took myself out. I kind of went right now. I need to kind of like imagine that, say, Tiger Woods was that my local golf club and he was. And I don't know how he's playing, but I'm watching him on the driving range hitting balls. And in his mind, he's thinking, I'm really hitting the ball shit. But if I was watching him, I'd think he's the most amazing thing I'd ever seen. So I kind of had to turn that around and go, I might feel like I'm playing shit, but all these people who are watching me are thinking, that was a great shot. How did he do that? How did he do this? So I kind of like, I'm a little bit more lenient on myself to kind of go, you know what? I have high expectations of myself, but even when I'm playing really shit, I'm still like pretty good to most people, you know, so it's sort of learning to sort of change your perception or change your psychology towards it, if you like, because, you know, um, there's nothing worse than going out there winning 
and feeling like you've you've embarrassed yourself or you've let people down, you know. And I, I've kind of learned to to kind of just realise that's just me, you know. It's not what everybody else is thinking, you know. Well, we're so hard on ourselves, aren't we? And I, I I was reading that bit in the book where you were talking about you were playing a match and you were you were winning, but you felt exactly as you just described. You felt like you were playing really badly, clumsily. Mm. That you felt mm. um, you were lacking confidence, and then you watched that. Mm game back on the TV and we're like, oh, I look super confident. I'm playing mm. really brilliant mm. snooker. And yeah. I think so many of us feel that. I mean, I'll have that. I'll sometimes even do one of these podcasts and think, oh, I fucked mm. that up so bad. And I listen back and mm. go, it's actually fine. And I think we all yeah. in life think we're doing so much worse than we actually mm. are. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and that's the key, you know, that's the thing, you know, it's sort of, it's, it's crazy, really, but you know, like I don't know. I just think you just you you, you kind of get to the point where I, I think I've been lucky enough to surround myself with people that I trust. You know, I've got a, a fellow called Steve Peters, and I've been fortunate enough to have great access to him. And and every time I sort of run things past him, he kind of tells me the truth. And you know, and he said to me, he said, "If I thought you was playing bad, I'd tell you." <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? He said so. You know, and you're not you're not playing bad. You're not doing bad. You know, and I'll be like, okay. And this was this this is this particular match you're talking about. I remember it was in the final, of the Masters. I said, Steve, you need to get down here because I'm I'm all over the gaff. And he was like, I've been watching you. You're doing great. And I'm like, no, Steve, you got to get down here because I'm I'm all over the show. So anyway, he come down. I won the final ten one, and he went, well, what do you reckon? I went, no, nah, still shit. I said, I played all four. <laughs> And then five years later, I watched that match. And the match you're talking about, I was like, wow, I played really well. So what I was feeling and what I was actually doing were like completely just not, they were just, it was, I had it wrong. So now I kind of have to sort of have trust in certain people. And I go, what did you make of that? And he went, yeah, there's a few mistakes, but on the whole, it's pretty good. And I went, okay, all right. So, you know, and it just, it just allows me to just keep going and not, you know, not feel so quite so bad about it, you know, you know, so. And do yeah. you think that's, it's also because your, your perspective of snooker has changed over the years in terms of, you know, you say these days, it's not about winning. You want to get out there and enjoy it and have a, a good time. So are you putting less pressure on yourself in terms of when you're playing a, you know, a, a sort of a match where all eyes are on you and it's, a, it's an international match. You're, mm. you're taking mm. the pressure off yourself a little bit with that. Yeah, well, it's, it's, I, I kind of realise it's impossible to flip that switch. I've always been a competitor. I've always wanted to perform really well. And like Steve said to me, he said, that will never go. He said, so when you ring me up on the Monday and you're stressing about a tournament starting on the Saturday, he said, I ain't worried. He said, because I know come Saturday, you're going to be on it. He said, I know it. He said, you know, he said, you, you've got that competitive animal in you. He said, what we've got to do is manage the build-up, manage your self-doubt and you know because it's 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 it, it's not you know you've got it out you know you said you're you're you're, you're very catastrophic thinker he said <laughs> so we kind of like got to get on top of that and I think that's what sort of happened and by trusting that I'm going to be all right when I need to be all right has become like so now when I go away to tournaments I, I don't worry about my game my practice has it gone well for me it's like every tournament I go away to it's like a holiday. So I said to my mate this morning, I said, when I go away, I said, I've got my running mates waiting for me. I says, I, I have breakfast with them. And then I go for coffee. Then I'll kind of hang out with my mate. I'll go and get some dinner. I said, if someone said to me, that holiday is going to cost you three, five grand for a week to go and do that, I would pay it. Mm. I said, but actually, I'm getting paid to be there and do that as well. I said, so I'm up for none. <laughs> I said, no matter what happens, wherever I go, I'm having a great time. So my hobbies and my and my love of running, keep fit, of just being sitting in coffee bars, just scrolling on my phone, that's like 95% of my day. The other 5%, yeah, I've got to put my suit on and yeah, I get a bit nervous. But I know that when it comes on, if I start performing badly, I'm going to get a bit pissed off at myself and I'm going to go, right, I've got to, like, I've got to find a way to win here. So that kind of naturally kicks in. So the build-up for me is it's just about managing the build-up and kind of worrying less about how I'm going to perform on the table and just trusting that it's going to work itself out no matter what. And the more, worry, the more I worry about it, the less I'm probably going to want to do it in the end. So it's about just... It's just about just... You know, like Steve Peter said to me, he said, if aliens 
came down and watched what you were doing, they'd go, well, he's actually taking this here, his sticks and balls on a bit of felt. What, he's really getting upset over, like, not performing. He said, you know, and I went, yeah, he went, it's ridiculous, Ronnie. <laughs> he said, I have to perform life-saving uh, operations on young kids. He said, and I have to sit there with their parents and go, this ain't looking good. He says, and you're moaning about the game. He went, come on, mate, get it into perspective. It's just a game and you've got a great life. Enjoy it. He said, because at the end of your career, you're going to go, I wish I enjoyed it more. So I've been fed so much of that stuff from Steve, which I'm so grateful that I've been able to meet him, that it's kind of just sunk in so much now that that shift has happened and it's like no turning back now. I don't want to go back to the old me. I'm happy where I am and, and, I, and I just want to keep it going. You know? And brilliantly, when you're enjoying something and you're in the mm. moment, you you are better at it, whatever you're doing. It's like you give the example in the book of Usain Bolt, who, you know, we've seen on the start line of many races, high-fiving everyone around him, smiling at the crowd. Everyone else is like serious, sort mm. of stressed, trying to get in the zone. And mm. But it's, it's counterintuitive because I, I know that mm. feeling and I can be a real catastrophic thinker as well. You know, I can get myself mm. in a a terrible hole worrying about things that are going to go wrong and yeah. it just doesn't serve you it doesn't get you anywhere it, and mm. I guess it is a discipline almost to allow yourself to enjoy something allow yourself to not feel the stress yeah no absolutely absolutely and, and, and listen I get criticized a lot because a lot of the players they they hear what I say I mean it was quite funny because I was saying to Stephen Hendry who was at the UK Championships recently and he went, we were just chatting. I went, Stephen, I actually don't give a monkey's, mate. If I get beat, I'm thinking, sweet, I'm in the pundit. And he went, he went, you know what? He said, I actually believe you now. He said, but when you first started saying it, I thought, no, that can't be true. And he went, but I know you mean it. And I went, I said, I'm telling you, mate. I said, this is where you need to be. And he went, I wish I could have done that myself. He said, and it's working for you. And that's what I'm saying. It's not like my performances have dropped off. They're still good. And a lot of the current players get a bit frustrated because obviously they think, well, he's got all these tournaments, all this stuff. And one of them said, well, why are you here playing? And I thought, well, because I want to be. I'm having a good time, mate. You know, I'm going to have the most amazing Italian food later and then I'm going to go for a run in the morning. That's why I'm here. That's what I'm saying. When people say to me, why do I play snooker? I go, I meet my running mates. Why do I play snooker? I get to sit in a coffee bar and scroll on my phone. Why, why do I play snooker? I get to meet my mate Robbie. Why do I play snooker? Um, you know, I get to like get some quiet time in my hotel room. Why do I play snooker? I get to like sit in bed at night and just have hot chocolate and just shut my eyes and just think, you know what, this is great. Why do I play snooker? I get my breakfast cooked for me. I get my bed made. I'm like, they're all really good reasons to keep playing snooker. <laughs> do you think a bit, you also have to, um, you know, we've all got an ego that is a given as a human being and you have to almost... Mm. Get in touch with your ego, uh, have a good line of communication with your ego, because it's the ego that for all of us will latch on to, you've got to win. You cannot mm. mess this up. You've got to be the best in the world. How mm. do you reason with, with that sort of thinking if it creeps in? Um, because I think, I think, I don't know. I think, I think, I think with me, I just feel like I'm, I'm fortunate enough to be in a position where I feel like I've, I have got nothing to prove. So if I was sitting here talking to you and I hadn't won a world title, I hadn't won anything, I might not have that luxury of saying, you know what, it doesn't matter whether I win or lose. So I don't want to kind of like sound like, you know, this person that's got it all sorted. No, I've, I've actually overachieved in my opinion. So I'm kind of quite comfortable to go, you know what, I've rinsed snooker and I've got more out of it than I ever thought. So let's just be a little bit grateful for that. And I'm kind of like, I can, I can maybe take a few you know, losses and loses and kind of be a bit philosophical about it. So, you know, um, I don't want to sort of come across as like, you know, because it could be, you know, the other way around where I'm, you know, like I said, you know, haven't achieved and, and I could feel pretty shit about myself. So, but I've just learned that if I keep thinking that winning is the, the route to happiness, then I'm going to be quite disappointed because when I look at my stats, I probably only win five, ten percent of the tournaments that I play in. So does that mean that ninety percent of the time I'm going to be miserable? No, it just means ninety percent of the time I just have to get up off the floor and come back again. And I enjoy the comeback. I'm one of them that like I, I like being beaten up and then going, you know what? I'm still here and then playing well and then going like that. Yeah, we can do it, you know. And it's kind of like, like you say, Usain Bolt. It's like. You yeah. can keep beating me, you can keep whatever, but I'm going to keep showing up. And each time he shows up, you know them competitors are thinking, 
fuck me, I wish he weren't here. And I just can't feel a bit like that when I play snooker. I turn up and I know that they're thinking, when's he going to retire? You know, because it's frustrating for him, you know. And and I kind of get off on it a bit to think, you know what? I'm staying fit and healthy just to piss you lot off. You know, yes. you're not getting an easy ride. You're not getting it. an easy ride. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> it's so good. I mean, one of the, the punchiest lines in the book, which I wrote down because I loved it so much, was that you say your greatest asset is that you'll crack, but you don't break. Why do you think that is? Is that just your nature? Is that lived experience? Yeah, I think I think I've sort of like built up this resilience over the years. I think it, it started when I was a kid at school, and I just I just wouldn't be told what to do. Um, so it's not like something that was put in me, but I think my dad recognised it and went, you know what, I've got something here. You know, I've just got to like channel it in the right direction. So he got me into all sports, but I think he knew that I had that that grit and determination to sort of like just keep going. Just you know, I, I, you know, I, I, you know, and, and I think over the years I've kind of. You know, we all have our ups and downs, you know, but obviously, you know, losing my dad when I did, my mum going to prison, you know, that was quite a lot to take on. And I just think that you kind of like, you get through them situations, you come out the other end of it and you go, right, well, that's, that's, I've, I've got through that. What else have you got to front me? And then something else comes and you kind of, oh, I got through that. And then, and then all of a sudden you start to, to motor on and you start to kind of like, you know, you know, you, you win a world title, then you win two world titles, you win three world, and then you think, oh, and then and all of a sudden you think, hold on, I'm, you start to feel like you can cope with anything. And I think it's just kind of like that inner confidence that you kind of get um, that I'm just a survivor. <laughs> Do you yeah. know what I mean? I'm just a survivor. I'll always come out. And I, and I know that if the worst situation happened to me, if all I had was my shirt on my back, get on a plane, go to Thailand, put my feet up and have friends there. And I know that I'll, I'll fit in anyway, you know, so I don't feel like I'm needy for the things that most people think that they need. I'm quite happy to go, you know what, have it all, but you're not having my sanity, you're not having my my, my freedom. You know, like Steve Peters says, he says, you're a bit like a leaf. He said, you blow around in the wind. He said, you hear you there. He said, but I know that. He said, so, and it's like his PA said, he said, Ronnie's meant to be here at 12 o'clock. And Steve went, don't worry about Ronnie. Ronnie will get here when he gets here. He said, let's just get on with our day. Yeah. And it's like, and he's, he's right. You know, I hate being like locked down to a time, to this, to that. So I'm, I, I like to just, I'm a bit of, a, like, I just go with the flow, you know? Well, I wonder if some of that <laughs> is, um, just in your DNA, naturally who you are, because I think reading the book, some of the experiences you've been through would floor people to the point where they would get stuck in that feeling of grief, injustice, whatever it might be. Like you say, you know, at the age of 16, your dad went to prison, not long after your mum went to prison and you at the age of 19, already mm. playing very high-end professional snooker. We're looking after yeah. your 12-year-old sister. I mean, that is mm -hmm. an unbelievable burden for a teenager and someone who's, you know, skyrocketing in, in the most brilliant career uh, with passion mm. attached to that. That mm. is a lot to cope with. And I mean, as you just said there, I guess when you're in the moment, you don't really, you're just getting through it. You have to survive mm. that. And maybe it's retrospective mm. that you look back and go, I can't mm. believe I got through that. I'm in one piece. Mm. Yeah, yeah, no, that's what I'm saying. That's, I think that's why, you know, a lot of the time as I get a bit older now, especially the last World Championships, I broke down like quite quite a lot really, like emotionally. And that was just because I had my daughter there, I had my son there, I had my dad there. And I just reflect, it was just reflective. You know, I was just reflecting on, hold on a minute. I remember the day when he went to prison. I remember the day when I had to leave them two little ones and didn't really have that bond with them. I remember that day where I got insomnia through stress, through anxiety, and I, and I was losing the plot. But I came through it and I found a way to kind of get on top of my life, my work, everything, to just to survive. And by winning them little battles and kind of like, kind of getting there and then getting to that World Championships last year and winning playing great and feeling good about it like I said that meditative state where I went you know what this is the ultimate gladiatorial here. I played John Higgins in the semi massive rival beat him unbelievable Judge Trump 33 years of age unbelievable player I'm 47 it's on me here 
I went, you know what? You're going to have everything. I'm going to give you absolutely everything this weekend. And, and it's last man standing. I went, wallop, wallop, wallop. And, and that was it. And I come out and I went, wow. And for me, that was like, you know what? That made me feel good, you know? So I think that's sort of like you kind of a bit more reflective in a way of sort of, of like, like I said yesterday, I said, you know what? Just listen, you know, through, through Jesse and Ronnie, like they know me well. I was like, I got lost, but they see that, you know, that was just like a, you know, and they were there for me and supported me and they know the story. And it's kind of like, I didn't ever think I'd get to this point where I was healthy, clean, little, you know, a little bit of sanity there. You know, I'm 47. I ain't got long to go. So even if it goes wrong now, who gives a fuck? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It's like, I've come this far. If this is as far as I get, I'll take it. You know what I mean? I'm not greedy. So I'm kind of like, all right with where I am and 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 if it don't get any better fine if it gets worse suck it up take it on life life can throw you know all sorts at you you know but it's just about you know just keeping your sanity at the end of the day and you know where I'll end up who knows it could be in some I could I could end up living in Kenya doing all the passions that I love which is running eating Ugali with them Kenyans cleaning their boots and getting him ready for his marathon, taking a young kid on, being his mentor, and I'd get such a buzz out of that. So that's where my joys are, is giving back, and sometimes giving back to the right people. So even if the shit is the fan, I could end up in Kenya as some sort of role model or some sort of, you know, some sort of giving guidance to some young kid that's got some talent. And I'm like, you know what? I'm going to make you an Olympic. You're going to do it, but I'm going to help you. Do you know what I mean? Let, let's do it. And that, that, so they're the sort of opportunities that I know that are out there. I just have to sort of, you know, I'm just be, you know, it's sort of like there, there's so much to do, you know, that, you know, that excite me, you know? Yeah, it's exciting. I think it's always exciting seeing that there could be a whole new chapter ahead. I think that's what kind of certainly gets me out of bed in the morning. And, you know, you mentioning there that you, you felt like, you know, you'd lost your way at some point and you mentioned... Mm my husband and my father-in-law who have also been on that, you know, exact journey of, of excessively drinking, et cetera, and then healing from that. But you did it quite way before both of those two. Um, you know, you were in the late nineties. You, you say that you hit rock bottom in Holland in the late nineties and that was pivotal yeah. for you. And that was pivotal yeah. for you to, yeah. to change your journey and to, and to mm. walk down a new path. Why did that feel like rock bottom at the time? What was the defining feeling of being in Holland and knowing things had gone too far? Because I just, I just got, kind of got to the point where I thought, I thought I was going to like, I thought, I said to my mate, I said, I'm, I feel like I'm, I said, I, I could, I feel like I'm going to die. <laughs> I said, Jerry, don't let me die in Amsterdam, mate. I said, whatever happens, just fucking make sure that you get me home or whatever it is. Just, and he went, I'm taking it. And he was like a big brother to me, Jerry. And he went, I'm with you. And I went, sweet. And I, and I realised then, I thought, this has got completely out of hand. Um, I need to sort myself out. I don't know when that moment was after Holland, but it, I was on the way to like, you know, I need to, to sort this out. So yeah, I was kind of the first one to sort of get myself into rehab, get myself clean. You know, I wasn't successful at staying clean. I would have three, four months cleaning. I'd be off the wagon. But I knew that it was the right thing for me to do, which was stay clean. And then I think, like you say, you know, I became like a bit of like, you know, if people wanted to get clean, it was like, ring Ronnie. Ronnie, yeah. Ronnie, Ronnie seems to have a little bit of an idea of how to kind of like do it. So it's been great, you know, listen, I'm so happy for your family, Jesse, you know, I, I, I watch from afar, speak to, you know, and it's so happy that everyone's happy, you know, and it's great, you know. It really is. It really is. And it's mm. it's obviously, whether it's due to addiction or it's just a lifestyle that you find yourself in drinking excessively, it's not an easy mm. thing to get out of. And obviously it's a motivator, I think, obviously for Jesse and Ronnie to help other people, but also why mm -hmm. I do this podcast to offer up stories where people know it is possible to get out of addiction mm -hmm. or loops where you are drinking excessively. What do you think yeah. the first step was for you? Was it rehab? Did that impact you in a way that that led you down a different path? Yeah, definitely. I think I think that was the, the if I didn't do that, then nothing else would have worked. You know, yeah. I kind of would have ended up a complete mess, um, throwing my career away, throwing my life away. You know, just you know, yeah, it wouldn't have been a pretty, pretty, pretty life. And I think 
rehab was gave me that sort of um well actually it was my first meeting so it was my first meeting i'm sitting in the circle 30 addicts sitting there and i'm looking around i'm thinking yeah, it's all right you know i'm sitting there I ain't, I ain't got to talk to anyone i'm just listening some nice little stories and then one fella started talking and i was like i thought was he talking he, he, i thought someone had said to him what i was going through because everything he said was how i felt and i'm looking at him he's got a nice jacket on he's got a nice bottoms on he looks all confident and i'm thinking i just i just thought if he can do it then you know and it gave me a belief and i went home and i was i went i went to that meeting feeling fucking depressed and dan and i went home thinking yes i was flying and i had my last joint i went i'm having my last joint <laughs> i'm in rehab tomorrow <laughs> <laughs> I went into rehab and uh, I'd done a month in there. I skitched out after two weeks, got all paranoid, went home for about four hours, went back to the rehab, done my month, got clean for about nine months, done the steps, done all that sort of stuff. And then I was like, you know what? I can be happy without drink and drugs. Um, it's just I've just got to stay away from it now, you know. But the, the healing period is about kind of like – you know, trying to find your personality again, you know, um, you know, going, you know, still doing life, but without, you know, drinking. And, and you, you, when you, when you first give up, you think I'm going to be the most boring person in the world. And in some ways, maybe I am, but I've kind of like embraced that and gone, well, where do I fit in? I don't fit in with the lads because I'm not a lad. So I'll go down the running club. I train Tuesday and Thursday night with them. I go I do a few races, I do a few park runs. I'll go to the Peak District or the Lake District and I'll climb a mountain and that's a great day for me and I'll have a nice little barbecue, bit of food, early night and I'm over the moon. So that's, you know, I've just kind of, you know, embraced that that's, that's all right for me. You know, it might not be for everybody, but, you know, we, we at least it gives us a chance to find a path that suits us, you know. And um, so rehab was definitely the first start and I think it was the most important one because, you know, addiction still runs through my life, but I choose to channel it into running, exercise, cooking, my work, my snooker, um, working with Steve Peters, you know, doing all that sort of stuff. I can be really obsessive with that sort of stuff, but I'd rather be obsessive with that because I know that that's taking me forward and it's sort of, um, and by me being good, I'm able to be good for my family and friends and be a, and be more of a supportive sort of person instead of a burden. You know, my mum and dad must have worried like shit for seven, eight years. Now they don't have to worry, you know. So I think it's the ripple effect. And then obviously, you know, just just keeping myself fit and healthy. And obviously the work I've done with Steve Peters, um, it's kind of like leveled me out now. I'm sort of like, I'm, I'm all right, you know. I'm, I kind of can see what's important, what's not important. And, you know, I, I can, you know, I can just roll with the punches a bit more, you know. Do you see a correlation between your drinking and what happened in your childhood? Was there a sense of running away from it? Or do you think that that addictiveness came from something else or just, I guess, genetically how you showed up in the world? Yeah, no, listen, I mean, that's a good question. And I, I said to my mum, I said, mum, I said, what was I like as a kid? I said, was I like, she went, no, nah, you was a happy kid. You was this and that. I had a great upbringing. I had a great life. You know, my mum and dad, yeah, it was dysfunctional. She was an Italian, beautiful looking woman. My dad was this little East End, funny, larger than life character. They were like at each other. It was like a scene out of The Sopranos, you know what I mean? It's like, you know, she, she, she pressed every button in his body. He was like, uh, and I grew up with that, but I had the best upbringing. My dad loved me, took me everywhere with him. My mum was a great mum. She was like a solid, solid person. Um, I was just destined to fucking, I was just a little fucker. You know what I mean? I just, I just had it in me, you know. I, I was just, I was just always up to no good as a kid. I couldn't help it. Um, not in a bad way, but you know, I was always in trouble, you know. So I was a trouble, I was a, tr I was a troublemaker, if you like. You know, I wasn't, you know, I was setting fires in the park and thought it was funny, you know. I was, I was driving the milk float down the road and, you know, I was doing stupid things, I was driving my dad's car up and down the road and around the block when I was 12. And it's like, you know, I thought that was what, it was fun, you know, but it wasn't, you know, it was just, I was just, a, a, you know, and, and my best mate's mum didn't want me to hang around with him because she was like, my George, you know, don't want him hanging around with Ronnie, but now she loves me. So, you know, I'm just, you know what I mean? You know, there's a good side to me, but then there's a little bit of a, a naughty child in there, you know, and, and, and he's still there, but I just learned to just sort of like keep him away, you know, like now I'm a, I'm a bit more, I use a bit more diplomacy, you know what I mean? I'm a little bit more, you know, like, you know, let's think of the bigger picture now, you know, I, I don't try and win every battle. 
And sometimes it's good to just, you know, let people save face sometimes and just, you know, just get on with your business, you know. And you say mental health wise, you would sway more towards anxiety than depression. Um, yeah. I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm the same these days. I think anxiety is always just in the background a little bit and I have to keep that at bay. Mm. How do you mm. deal with that today? Because I know in the book, you also talk about that affecting you in social situations, which again, resonates massively. Um, I don't love socializing. It has to be with you know people that I know very well or sort of small groups to feel mm. completely mm. at ease and myself. How do you yes. deal with that? Because obviously your job is, well, can be very social. You're at tournaments, there's lots of people, spectators or players who you're going to be mooching around with. How do you, how do you keep the anxiety at bay? Right. My snooker turns me into an antisocial person uh, because it becomes, I become like edgy. And when I become edgy, I become like, I ain't got time for small talk. I ain't got time. I don't, you know what I mean? I'm, I'm preoccupied. I'm like, you know, I'm, I, you know <laughs> it's like, so I kind of end up shutting myself off from the world, if you like. I might have three or four people with me and I can like unload on them and we can have a laugh. Even when I'm having a nightmare, we can have a laugh about it. So I kind of like, when I'm playing, I accept that part of that is that I'm going to become this unsociable person. But the minute I get beat, I'm like, oh, now I can relax. I become the most social person in the world. So what I've learned to do is to kind of go that there are times when I'm going to be unsociable, but I don't want to be an unsociable person. So I'm not unsociable when I'm doing my work with Eurosport. I'm not unsociable when I'm doing this stuff with you. I'm not unsociable when I'm doing stuff that doesn't, you know, get into my bones. You know, this is just nice stuff. I'm not unsociable when I'm doing a few little property stuff that, you know, that I do or I'm doing some art, you know, buying a bit of art and I'm selling it or anything you know, like that. I just go, this is exciting. And I'm like, I want to, you know what I mean? Or I'm down the running club. I'm like the most social person in the world. But I've learned to do a lot more of that stuff because that changes me. It makes me a nicer person. It makes me a much more social person. I don't have the anxiety. I can sit there in a room of 500 people that I don't know. I'm, you know, I just buzz off of everybody. But if I'm in the middle of a tournament or I've got the World Championships coming up and you put me in a room full of 500 people, I want to run for that exit door. I'm like, get me the fuck out of it. <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? But I also have some really good quotes that I say to a lot of people because a lot of people, when they see me, they want to talk about snooker. And I'm like, I don't actually want to talk about it. Like, they go, when's your next tournament? And I'm like... So now I just say to him, I said, I don't actually play anymore. And I go, really? And I go, yeah, I'm done with it, mate. I said, I'm time out. I said, I'll do a bit of punditry. I'll do a bit of this. I said, life's sweet. And you can Brilliant. see him. So I just kill the conversation. I kill conversations that I don't want to have. <laughs> and 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 then and, and it was quite funny because one woman she went to me, oh, you, you know, when you're playing this, I said I don't play no more. But literally, I'd played the day before. <laughs> it was in London, you know, in London, and I see her look at me like that as if to say but you were playing yesterday. And I went, have a nice day. And I was like, out of there. That is great. You know, so sometimes what I do is I realise I'm actually really a nice person to talk to when I'm talking about something that I'm actually interested in. I'm not really interested in snooker because it fucking burns my head out. I talk <laughs> about running. I talk about mental well-being. I talk about nice food, restaurants. You know, what's, what's this one up to? And that, you know, and that. But get me on snooker. And I'm like, boing. I'm like, Ooh. You know, do we really have to talk about that? So I've learned to eliminate conversations. By lying. Yeah, you just have to lie. You just have to lie. lie. You know, there's, no, there's nothing wrong with a lie, you know. Um, it's, oh, for the benefit, it's for the benefit it's of great everybody. Great tip. Yeah, exactly. It's a great tip. Um, mm. How else might anxiety show up in your life today? Do you still feel it in other areas? Um, listen, I, I, I'm, 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 I'm a natural first emotion is panic. Yeah. catastrophic thinking so I realised that and I kind of go oh come that's that's just normal so now let's like sit down and like let's get a bit of a perspective on it is it really worth me thinking this about that no it's not you know like Steve Peter said aliens felt balls really we're going to start taking this shit serious now what's really important is having a cup of tea with me mate how are you doing you alright how's your mum how's your dad yeah they're all good Steve you alright how's your running yeah all good right, lovely that's that's the important things you know what I mean just just the day-to-day -day things that make us happy. So um, I think, what was the question again? I'm sorry. If, 
<laughs> if you feel anxiety in other bits yeah. of your life or how, well you've just said panic there I know in the book you yeah. talk about yeah. you feel panic about people leaving you again I'm yeah. imagining that correlates to your parents going to prison when you're a teenager yeah. is that something yeah. that still affects you I think I'm a bit of a needy sort of person in in some ways you know I'm, I'm not good at being alone and I, I, w- I would always say, well, no, I'm all right being alone. But Steve Peters went to me and said, no, you, you need people. <laughs> I was like, oh, really? Because he, he's always right. Um, so I've realised that that's, that's part of me, that I'm always going to need something. So it's the running club or it's running friends or it's just, just, just people in general. So, yeah, I kind of like, I, I kind of need that in my life, really. You know, I'm probably better when I'm around you know, people that I feel comfortable with. Um, but yeah, listen, I mean, anxiety. And when I say anxiety, for me, anxiety is where I feel trapped. You know, a little bit of edginess, a bit of pressure. That's different. You know, I can function in the world. I can still have a conversation with someone. Anxiety is when I'm sitting there and I'm like, literally, it's like I can't breathe. And I probably get that once a year, twice a year. It's always related to a big snooker match or a big snooker tournament. Sometimes I don't get it because I'm managing it really well. My game's good and everything's just in place. And I'm like, you know, we're all right here, you know. Um, so, but in general, I'm usually not that much of a panicker really because I think it's really that important to me in that respect. You know what I mean? It's sort of like I'm sort of, um, yeah, I'm sort of, I, I think I've, I think I've, kind of got uh, quite a lot of things that I enjoy doing that if I keep kind of doing them it like I can you know 10% of my life is is going to be tough where I've got to go and play snooker but the other 90% of my life is doing a lot of things that I enjoy so when you like when you've got 90% pushing against the other 10% the other 10% hasn't got a chance to really get in and if it does get in I kind of go all right we've just got to nip this in the bud it's just for a short period you know you know it's going to be all right tomorrow you know, what I mean? yeah. put the cue down, go home, rest, put the feet up, be with my family, friends. Might, you know, take me three, four days just to like proper decompress, but it's going to be fine, you know. So you kind of like, you know, you, you kind of like can, can look ahead and kind of see that it's, it's just fickle. Like, you know, yeah. a lot of the stuff that is bothering us is fickle and, and, and give it, giving a little bit of time, half an hour, an hour, or a little conversation with someone. Someone might say something, yeah, you kind of like, you know what? So I, you know, so I'm much more aware that it it is a fickle sort of life can be fickle, you know. And let's talk about running because you it seems like it saved you in many ways. What was the transition from feeling awful in Holland and drinking yeah. to excess to then you're now running like you're competing, you're running at a high level and your training is intense. And as you say, you've got these running clubs all over the UK where you've got friends that you Mm. meet up in different venues that become your sort of running buddies. How did you end up uh, running and and, and loving it so much? Um, I'm not sure I love it, but I actually got (laughs) so into it and I got to a half decent standard where I went, you know what? It's hard to not enjoy something when you do it half decent. Yeah. So I was kind of like, you know, it, you know, I kind of got sort of – the problem came when I was so into the running that I set, I was playing at snooker tournaments and I was thinking, I don't want to be – I want to be running with my mates. And then I was being in the tournament and there'd be a race on the Saturday and I'm thinking, if I get beat on the Thursday, I can get home Thursday night, Friday, be ready for the race Saturday. I got home and I said to Terry, I said, tell me. I said, I've got a bit of a problem here. I said, the running's like obviously more important than the snooker. Uh, you know, but it's not good, mate. I'm, I'm still only like 20, 28, 29. I, you know, it's my job. So he said, look, what I'll do is I'll, I'll introduce you. Where's your next tournament? I said, Telford. He said, right, I'll get onto the local running club. So he introduced me to him. I turned up. He said, here's, here's, here's this girl's number. It's Claire. Um, he said, you're meeting her at 7.30 at this pub. So I went to the pub. And I went, oh, you're Claire. And she went, yeah, you're running. I went, sweet. She said, right, take it to the gang. So we went out for a run. I was running with Tim Don, who was the world triathlon champion at the time. I was running with a fellow called Chris Davis, who ran in the Commonwealth Games and has run 5K in 13 minutes, 20 or something. And I'm thinking, wow, this is like, like I said, I would pay for this experience. So we went out, we had a seven, eight, nine mile run. I got to know Chris really well. I went, there's some tickets for the match. You and your dad, 
all week. Come and watch when you want. He went, lovely. He went, mum's cooking some dinner later. Come around. So I went around there. She had a bit, all like this, potatoes, food, lovely cakes. I mean, I'm thinking, this is unbelievable. So I went to Terry. I went, magic, mate. I said, I said I'm in Ireland next week. Same again. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> so literally, I've kind of created all these friends in this, this little bond of, of, of running mates. And basically, I'm very good at getting comfortable in somebody's ass. And the minute they invite me <laughs> on, I'm like, shoes off, up on the sofa, remote control. <laughs> and I go, I said, the, snoop, the, the, the football's on the other, or the boxing's on. I go, do you want to watch it? I go, oh, I'd love to watch it. And bang. So I've got, I've got the telly. I've, I love know, it. I'm making a tea. I'm, I'm very good at getting comfortable in other people's asses. <laughs> You've created a lovely community feel and you've got mm. new friends and you've also got this wonderful mm. hobby. And you say there, because I'm, you know, I was intrigued as to how you ended up loving running, but as you just said, you don't love it. And no. I think it's really important when we look at hobbies or things that can help us that we're not pinning everything onto it, that we've got to feel complete euphoria. Because you say even yeah. when you're practicing snooker, mm. it's either for pain or relief. So the pain yeah. is punishment the relief is you're creating some sort of safety with that kind of practice do you yeah. experience the same with running because obviously physically it's painful mentally it can be quite torturous do you look for that in new challenges that there's got to be a sort of a pain pleasure ratio yeah I mean when I say pain and relief a lot of why when I would play snooker I would only play just to see if I still had it and I said to Steve is I said, it's fucking driving me mad. I said, because I'm going there and if it's not there, I'm frustrated. And if I go there and it's good, I'm scared that the next day I go there, that it's not going to be good. He said, so how can you enjoy your practice? Is all you're, all you're going to get is pain or relief. Relief that you're playing well and pain that you're not playing well. He said, so that's got to go out the window, mate. He said, that's, that's, that's not champion thinking. Champion thinking is I'm going to go there, do my job. He said, because if I'm doing a, an operation on the kid and I'm thinking... Oh, I think they ain't right at home, this and that, and I mess up. He says, that ain't good. He says, so you've got to be the same. He said, when you go to that table, it's like, I'm just here to pop balls, turn into a robot. Whether it's good or bad, it doesn't matter. Because when you get on the start line, the lights go on, the crowd come on, you're going to perform. He says, so let's not worry about the forms, good and bad. That's, you know, that's just life. He said, so, but if you're going just to sort of, you get confirmation that you can still play or you can't play, you're never going to be in a good place. So I've kind of learned that searching for something is not a good thing to do. Just go out, do it. If it's shit, it was shit. If it was good, it was good. Who gives a shit? Tomorrow's another day. I'm going to enjoy my dinner. I'm going to enjoy whatever I've got to do. They're the most important things. And it's kind of like, you know, that I kind of have to, and I only do that with snooker because snooker, like I said, gets into my bones. With running, I'm not a good runner. I, I love it. I'm keen. I get out there and I do my best. And if I come like hundred out of two hundred runners in a cross country race, I feel like a champion. <laughs> you know what I mean? But if I come hundred out of two hundred in a snooker competition, I'm going to think that's a complete failure. So they're they're completely two different things. But you know, I've, I've learned to just enjoy and just you know, giving my best. I'm giving my best now. I'm giving my best when I go home later tonight. I'm going to give my best when I get up in the morning. I'm going to just give my best in every situation. It might not be brilliant, but I'm going to show up and I'm, and I'm not going to fucking moan and I'm not going to like, you know, scream. I'm not going to put it like, let's just get on with it. Do you know mm. what I'm saying? And, and like, yeah. what will be, will be, you know? And, and it's kind of, it's, it's a lot better way to get through because I can be 100% confident that I can do that, but I can't be 100% confident I'm going to play well every day. That just doesn't happen. But I can be 100% confident I'm going to do my best. And even if I don't feel good, I'm still going to do my best. Do you know what I mean? Like we had a photo shoot here this morning. I was absolutely knackered. And I thought, I could sit here sulking and I'm tired. And I was like, nah, just fucking give it your best. And I said to him, I've done my best. I said, I felt, but he went, no, you was great. And I said, you know, you know, but sometimes you can feel a bit sorry for yourself and uh, uh, moaning. Like, I don't want to be a moaner. No, I get it. And do you know what? I think <clears throat> I needed to hear a lot of that. And I'm sure a lot of people out there did, because I think we're culturally taught to pin everything onto winning, success, doing things mm. well. But like you've just said there, it's a really treacherous path to walk when you're pinning feeling good on only mm. winning and feeling mm 
bad on losing because I can do it even about a podcast again. I'll go, Mm. that went well. Now I'm allowed to feel happy the rest of the day or, oh, that was a bit of a shocker. Now I've got to feel shit Mm. about myself for the next four or five days. And it is, you waste time and it is Mm. utterly pointless. So I think it's really an important note in any, not even sport, in anything Mm. that you enjoy doing or that you want to do well at is just to sort of take that pressure off and just go and do your best without wondering what the result's going to be. Absolutely. You know, that's why I say about Usain Bolt, because when yeah. I watched him, I went, that's who I want to be. Whether he was stacking shelves in Tesco or whether he's running the Olympic under, that is, that is who you want to be. I don't want to be the fella there that's dressed out, all pent up, and, and he might win it, but he still ain't that. He, he doesn't look like he's enjoyed it. And for me, you want to feel like, I'm, I want to look like the guy that's actually enjoying what he's doing, win, lose, draw, whatever. I want to still come out and go, you know what, I actually enjoyed that. And because I spent a lot of time winning and not enjoying it. So I, 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 I have had that privilege, if you like, of winning a lot and not being happy. And I've had that privilege of not winning so much, still doing all right, but being happy because I've got the right balance. And I went, I'm not prepared to win a lot, but be unhappy anymore. So I'm more kind of like about, you know, life's, life's, life's a marathon. It's not a sprint. And if I want to get from here to there and feel all right, I've kind of like got, sometimes you've got to turn the dimmer switch down on certain things. Yeah. Now if I've got a lot going on. I've got the snoop, I've got the book, I've got the documentary, I've got my kids, or I've got Layla and I've got this. It's like, they all can't be on full blast. I've kind of got to go, you know what? The book's important. This is important. Layla's important. Snook has got to take a back switch, it's back seat. So I turn the dimmer switch down and turn it off. But I just turn it down and I allow myself to go, you know what? If the results ain't great, it's all right. You know what mm. I mean? You know, I can go back to that. I can turn that one up and then turn these other three down. But it's juggling. It's like, how do you juggle it? But I don't want to be that person that tries to do everything but end up hating everything he does. Because that, yeah. that can as well, you know. And we've all got busy lives. And it's sometimes it's about doing, you know, just playing about with the dials a bit, you know. Do you think to be <clears throat> the best <clears throat> at anything, you have yeah. to endure great pain? Because, you know, I, I watched that Usain Bolt documentary and yeah. loved it. And he is... You know, he enjoys or did enjoy yeah. what he did very much and he enjoyed the races, but there was a lot of pain in the training, yeah. in the dedication, yeah. in the sacrifice. Mm. Do you think you'd yeah. be the best without that? No, I think you have to, you know, there's some people like the, the athletes, they 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 like the, the feeling of discomfort. They like when they when it gets uncomfortable and that pain hits that's when they start to go I'm really enjoying this I ain't one of them I'm not into physical pain when I'm running I'm thinking like this is getting a bit harder but what I can do is I can take on a lot of mental pain <laughs> so snooker is not a, like a physical sport but it's a very mental sport but what I'm able to do is take on a lot of mental so like when my agent I sat down with him one day and I went I've got this going on that going on this and that and he looked at me and he went he said I don't know how you do it he said I couldn't live your life <laughs> and I went really yeah <laughs> I went really he went no he said I couldn't do it mate he said, I, you know and, and I went oh all right but it, we've all got the ability to take on a lot of pain at something Usain Bolt can just smash out 200 meters after two run with a tire behind him and he can go yeah that and he gets off on it you know um I get off on maybe mental pain and I'm able to kind of go you know what I can deal with that and come through it and be stronger for it um, so I think you do need to kind of, I don't want people to think that like quit on life. No, Steve Peters always said to me, he said, no, nah. he said, I'm not saying you've got to quit on life. He said, but what I am saying is you don't need to, to burn up all this energy. He said, like, you know, 10 minutes before you go out and play, you switch on. He said, and when you switch on, we want you focused. He said, but the minute it's over, you put that cue down, you switch off. He said, and it's a skill. And I think that's what Usain Bolt was able to do. He could switch on, switch off, switch on, switch off. And that's, that's, that's something you can kind of learn. But I do definitely think to be successful, you need to kind of, you need to graft it out. You know, you need to get in the trenches. You need to put that time in. You need to make the mistakes. You need to, you need to foul a lot. <laughs> yeah. Do you get what I mean? You spend, yeah. like I said, you spend 90% of our life failing, but our failing is still not failing. It's just, we just come up against an opponent that was on fire that day. You know, I, you know, we've all got things where we kind of go, you know what, that weren't great. But, you know, it's part and parcel. Steve Peters always said to me as well, he said, you got, you know, if you want to be a snooker player, you've got to accept the ups and downs. He said, if you want snooker in your life or you want running in your life or whatever you want in your life, he said, you've got to accept 
the ups and downs that come with it. Otherwise, don't do it. Yeah. And I went, I like that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's good because we can you easily know. all look at people at the top of their game and think, oh, yeah. it's all right for them. They're lucky. They're smashing it, whatever. It's like you, you don't get it w- without the pain. What I also like learning in the book is the time you ensure you have in the day to get an MS scone. Well, that's a Sheffield thing because obviously right. it's sort of like, I think like Sheffield is 17 days of what my mate calls it, smothering yourself in mustard. He's <laughs> like, it, it is fucking evil. He said, I don't know how you do it. He said, but it's like you're just smothering yourself in it. Yeah. And you just kind of got to go through it. So I went, okay, well, I'm going to have to go through it. So I have two rules. I don't practice before any of my games because all I'm going for is pain or relief. So I take that out of the game. I've done my work. Another 10 minutes on that practice, so I ain't going to make the slightest bit of difference. So I put me, I put me iPhone on, I stick me fucking only fools and horses on or whatever it is. I put my feet up, put the kettle on, and me and me, mate, we have a great 45 minutes just chatting. There's no stress. Another thing that I like to do is have me scone and me clotted cream and me jam. I go, you know what? That is going to get me through two, three, four hours. And I just, it's like a little thing. that It's, like, it's my little treat I love to myself. It. You know, it's like some people like like go out for coffee with your mate and you, you just enjoy that time with your girlfriend or your mate. And you go, you know what, I'm only having a coffee sitting out in the sun, but why am I feeling so fucking good? You know what I mean? So it's like incorporating little things like that in, in my work. You know, that little coffee in that room and watching TV and having that scone is while I'm smothering myself in mustard. So while I'm getting the mustard on, I might as well have a bit of scone and cream just to sort of like, you know, like it's like, it's like tug of war. You know what I mean? I love it. There's something just so perfect about a scone. They're, they're just the best. They are amazing. Just, yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolute I heaven. To probably 25 scones in 17 <laughs> days at Sheffield. <laughs> Sometimes it's two a day. <laughs> that's on a real mustardy day you got to go in for, the, for the double whammy must, yeah. <laughs> oh mate sometimes it's three, sometimes I've got some left over and I go back to my room and I'm like I'm having two of them and my mate's looking <laughs> and I'm like I don't give a fuck how this makes me feel I'm running I love them, it man. I love it oh my god Ronnie it's been so good talking to you and mm. I've it's made me think differently about a lot of things actually talking mm. to you about my own selfishly about my own life and how I think mm. about things and that reward sort of system I don't know mm. I, it's given me a lot to chew over so thank you so much and, and good luck with the book it's brilliant and um and just great to talk to you lovely nice to speak to you too